Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Salvador. I'm a speech language pathologist and today we are going to be talking about gender and intersectionality in communication sciences and disorders or CSD. You can also call it speech language pathology or SLP. I know there's going to be a lot of acronyms that you might be encountering here. So I'm actually very lucky to be recording this lecture in a cabin somewhere in the middle of BC. And if you happen to hear some birds in the background, I do apologize for that, but also I'm not sorry. I hope you guys are having a wonderful summer, um, but I'm happy that you're here to listen to this lecture. And if you find that you're listening to this as a podcast, that's okay. Um, there are some key things that I do want to talk about, but essentially this is an overview of what it's like to be a speech language pathologist or an SLP, particularly an SLP of color. So I'm not sure how much you've heard or if you've heard of a role like mine before, um, but this is kind of just a general overview of the services that I have and how I provide gender um, affirmative and inclusive practice as a SLP. So here, definitely, I will talk about gender and intersectionality, how it's relevant in my field in different lenses, like I said. Um, and just as a context, so SLP is predominantly female and white. And according to some previous U.S. labor statistics, it is the fourth widest profession in their nation, just trailing behind veterinarians, tradesmen, and farmers. And I'm pretty sure and I'm confident that um, the Canadian context is not that far from what they experience in the United States. So some key things before we start is that I just want us to be mindful of the questions that I have set um, or I've put forward for us to think about for the next 30 minutes, 30 uh, ish minutes that we're that I'm going to be talking. Um, so, what does it mean to practice in a traditional female field? How is the field addressing the dialogue about gender? sensitive and intersectional practice? How is it perpetuating traditional beliefs? Finally, how does an outsider or a person of color situate themselves in this context? So I'm hoping that this talk will lead you to more questions and reflect on how gender and intersectionality plays a role in your experience and in your understanding of what communication can be in the context of gender and maybe race-based or mm, like the dynamics of inclusion. Okay, so let's start with this quote by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, fight for the things you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. I know that, I, I guess this quote is very timely because of the Roe v. Wade um, decision. And I'm not going to talk about that, but I do think that it's nice to start with this intention as a speech language pathologist, particularly somebody who is part of only just a few SLPs who have different experiences than the majority. And I do feel that it is necessary for me to use my role as an SLP of color to provide that voice for the people that I work with and also the other SLPs who are quite like me, who would like to have a voice in the table when um, they're making, they as in like, big institutions like school systems, education, or healthcare systems, or even associations that advocate for us. Like, we want to have a spot in that table so that there is, um, 
bit of a reflection of the kinds of services that we should be providing, not only to a majority culture, but to different kinds of peoples and in their different situations. So that is more of a mantra that I um, repeat to myself a lot of the time, and it can be tiring, but it's a nice way to start off this presentation. So our outline for today is just, you know, this is going to be very quick. So this, there's an outline about me for sure, my background and prior experiences, how this has shaped who I am right now, the work that I do, the reflections on my experiences as an SLP, and as well, just a path forward on what is being done, some questions and maybe some action items. So let's start about me. So I was born and raised in Manila, Philippines. So I'm, I speak Tagalog. And um, it's just very interesting how, looking back now, how I came to the field of SLP or speech language pathology. So it all started maybe in high school, and this is, might be more of a narrative for you, or a personal narrative, I guess. But when I was in high school, you can see my high school on the left is very different from the Canadian setting. We have uniform, or we had uniforms. We had these rundown chairs, but to us, it was a privilege of being in that school because it was more of a science focused high school. And for the last, like in the last year of my schooling there, we were trying to figure out what we were going to do in university or in college. And a lot of my classmates said, Oh, I want to be an engineer, a lawyer, a doctor, a molecular biologist. And I felt that. Those are great jobs, but I wanted to do something that was different enough, and but it had some impact on other people because I do like working and helping people, working with and helping people. So my mom came across a friend who was an SLP who was actually practicing in Canada at that time, and she had mentioned maybe you want to try SLP and I did and I didn't know what it entailed but as I learned more about it how it studies language the system of communication in like humans but also in other um, in other life forms is very interesting and that kind of led me to my friend like my classmates in the next picture in the middle, these are all my um, classmates back in my first year of undergrad in SLP. And I felt like the picture here was kind of a formative experience for me because we actually went out to a community and we offered some like, it, it was almost like a tutoring class for children who came from um, less fortunate homes who had they had reading difficulties um, they had like social interaction difficulties and it was just kind of nice to be part of that community and to make them feel welcome and be able to help them in what they were struggling with so I felt like even though I had left uh, Philippines to pers like to be with my family in Canada, I do felt I, I do feel like that was one of the reasons why I still wanted to continue with speech pathology. It's because we want to help people, especially those who need most of it, but they don't have the resources to actually, access them you know and so now here I am 
after all of the twists and turns, and that's kind of maybe a story for another day, I'm now here like um, practicing SLP in a school and privately. And it's just strange to think how like actual experiences or even the people that you meet shapes your interests and your advocacies that you learn to embody, I guess, in your current like lives and in your current roles. So I'd like to ask you to like think about all the people that you have met thus far, maybe in your program. How have they changed the way that you thought about your career path? And it's very funny because this was something that one psychology professor told us when I was in my doing my undergrad here at the University of Alberta. Um, she said that all of her life choices or where she is now was based on the people that she has met. And I think that that still rings through, uh, true to me, even to this day. Um, and so, like, I, I encourage you to also think about how that applies to your experience and your own situation. So now let's talk about the work that I do. And, you know, for me to be able to talk about the current issues, maybe, uh, it's a good idea to have just a basic understanding of what my field is. So let's talk about that. So <clears throat> what is speech, speech language pathology? I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it. But um, something that we did in my first year of grad school was they had us define what SLP or speech language and communication, what they mean. And at first it was maybe because a lot of my classmates were keeners, they had a difficult time or we had a difficult time defining what it meant. But for this purpose of just having a basic understanding. So speech is a mode of communication. So what I mean by mode is that we speak. So we speak verbally, we can write. So that's a different mode of, to communicate. Um, some uh, other animals use maybe some tones like dolphins, that kind of thing. So speech is just a mode of communication, whereas language is the rule-governed system of communication. So many different, we have different languages and they have different rules that we have to learn. Some languages are easily decipherable than others, like English. It takes a lot of systematic learning for you to understand how it works uh, so that's pretty much language and then communication is the ability to engage in a back and forth interaction for different purposes so are they mutually exclusive they can be but they're also like interrelated with each other like is there a hierarchy there can be a hierarchy in that communication overarches speech and language but many people have different interpretations of it so this is what we're going to use to define everything that i talk about um, for this lecture and if you have any more questions you want to learn more about that i have my email and you can just con connect with me and we can have a chat about it so knowing the difference between speech language and communication what is speech language pathology? So here is my scope of practice. So the common thing that people think about speech pathologists is that we work on we work on speech. So when a child or an adult has difficulty using their ver verbal mode of communication, they work with a speech therapist. 
and for most of the time that is true but there are other things that we also do besides just working on that verbal expression so we do a lot of like um, treatment for uh, people with language disorder so they have difficulty expressing themselves in like both languages or one language that they have we also work with people of swallowing difficulties after a stroke so there's a lot of things that a speech language pathologist can work on but because there's not a lot of us there isn't that much awareness on what we can do outside of the typical like speech prototype or stereotype i guess and there are speech pathologists that work in hospitals there are speech pathologists that work in schools like me there's also slps that work in private practice like me as well um, so this is kind of this slide has an infographic of just the different areas that we can work with so basically a lot of people with communication disorders but also you know like for us to learn what we need to work on for people with communication disorders we have to know what the typical like expectations or like the norms are or what people do typically for us to know when a person ha is having extreme difficulties in maybe speech language or both or even communication in general so there's a lot to it um, but I'm just like sharing what my scope of practice is before we can kind of delve into how that relates to different experiences of like clients depending on who they are so like i said um when we learn a lot about we have a question of whether it is just is it a true disorder or is it just a difference is it like a like in the same way that we have left-handed or right-handed people is it just a difference or is it more a disordered behavior so there are many things that apply to gender and that intersectionality piece one is with <clears throat> sorry gender affirming voice treatments so it's like i don't work with adults personally and this is not my area of expertise but there are slps who do work with um people who are transitioning and they would like to sound more feminine or more masculine so gender affirming voice treatment is something that slps work with a lot and depending on where you are it's i think it's a little bit more um acceptable here in canada but there are some institutions in the united states that even like providing those services to people who need it don't have access to it because because of certain biases that occur in like bigger institutions right so um it's really tricky to provide those services if the place that you're in or the province or state that you're in um does not find gender affirming voice treatments as something that is helpful for some people and that's where a lot of like the advocacy comes in and a lot of just that like fighting to have a voice for these um, clients. Then we also have in the realm of gender some issues in diagnosing difficulties. So there is actually some study and I, I apologize if I can't cite where 
the study is specifically, but many reports have shown that um, there is actually a difference in how clinicians or SLPs diagnose speech or language disorders in that many disorders are more, um, or sorry, more boys or more male get a diagnosis than females. And that's not just true for language disorders, but they're also true for, for example, um, diagnosing autism spectrum disorder or autistic people. So there's more men or male uh, males that get diagnosed in, with that disorder than females. And maybe it is the case that, so that like the most obvious thing is that maybe it is the case that there are more men who have it, but that's not, that's not really indicative of reflective of the current population. It's just that maybe we've just been biased to look into the behaviors that occur much more in boys than with girls. But like the true prevalence of girls having that disorder will could be more than what we think it is. So there's kind of their that gender bias. Um, in diagnosing kids that's why or not ju not just kids but also adults so it's so important to be actively looking for studies and research that help us become better at screening both female and male um, so that we are able to catch all those kids or all those people who truly need the services so that's in the aspect of gender. Now we move on to bilingual, multilingual issues and cultural biases. And that's kind of like a big thing for me because I am also a bilingual. And the biggest thing is, is it a disorder or a difference? So although they're like universities are and even institutions are slightly getting better at identifying or teaching people how to be aware of their cultural biases. <clears throat> there is still that um, disparity in how people of color get diagnosed with language disorders, even though even though it's more of a language difference. So for example, like you would have a kid who just moved, Filipino kid, for example, I'll just think from like my story. And it was in my experience, but just a hypothetical like immigrant coming from the Philippines and then they move on and their first language was also pretty good, but they're struggling to learn English. And I have heard a lot of stories and I've experienced a lot of teachers, not even teachers, professionals or other clinicians making comments about um, a kid's, like, like this immigrant kid's knowledge in English makes them, like because they're struggling in English, makes them a disordered person where it's actually not the case that they're still learning that language and they need lots of time and lots of exposure to be able to learn that language so that's what we call more of the over diagnosis so when we think that kids from multicultural households have a language disorder when in in fact they do not and they're just it's just the way that their language system works in their brain um and the other piece is just under diagnosing. So when we are aware, when at the times that we are aware of other people having different language systems, such as bilingual, multilingual um, families, then some people are also wary of just diagnosing kids overall because they, they feel that some children are gonna catch up but so there's kind of like a balance between knowing 
when to diagnose a true language difficulty or a speech difficulty versus knowing if it's just a language difference. And this isn't going to be solved just by one PD. It has to be a continuous reflection of the clients that you work with, the kids, your caseload, what that looks like and how accurate are you in diagnosing or providing treatment when it is necessary or is it not necessary at this specific time. So there's quite a bit of things to think about as a clinician in terms of gender and that um, equity, like diversity um, piece when you are um, providing cl uh, service to a client. Yeah. So yeah, there we talk about we talked about cultural diversity, um, and what I do want to add here is that it's so important to be aware of different ways that people live and a lot of SLPs and I know that a lot of them are working on it but there there are still some clinicians that are not very sensitive to the needs of that current family and also the their customs right so when we ask families to provide some sort of treatment or intervention we have to keep in mind how they're gonna how they're gonna follow through with it if they have other experiences other than a majority a person raised in a majority household if that makes sense so there's a lot to think about not only in diagnosing kids or people but also in the way that we set our goals to help those families or clients and the follow through aspect of that. Yeah, and then we talked about gender. So let's move on to, I was just looking at the time and we don't have a lot of time is <laughs> the bottom line. So let's move quickly into my reflections and something that we've already been talking about. Um, so how does intersectionality play into this? As a clinician providing services, well, I talked a lot about diagnosing and treating. So the main consideration is who gets access to the services. And that's a big thing in Alberta right now because of our budget cuts. And so people in healthcare and people like accessing service through the education system are they getting the supports that they need and this is already a problem for people who live here like people who are part of the majority culture but with other people like with other families who have other disadvantages ahead of them like their race or their color their gender and also the class, right? So lower income families coming from multilingual um, households are less likely to access these services. And so with a model that we have now, there is a move to for many families to access help through private services. And that's not usually attainable for some families coming from lower income um, or lower SES multicultural households because all they're trying to do right now is to survive, get food on the table, that kind of thing. And this is not to say that that's just for multicultural families. Like I acknowledge that there are people who are part of the majority culture who still have those struggles. But when we think about it, intersectionality with race, class, gender, all of those put into play makes it harder for people just to get the baseline of what they need. So this is this has to be something that we should be talking more in terms of accessing to services, access to services, um, 
and as well like follow through with treatment so like how can i expect a family to be able to read to their child even just like 15 minutes per day if they're like both parents are working for like 12 hours just to keep their family afloat so we have to be as clinicians we have to be really thinking about the situation of the family when we um, look at goals what is attainable and what is the priority of the family right now and um, how does inter does intersectionality play into this or being an SLP of color so this is something that I still think about every single day I'm so I invite you to look at the AXOPA. So AXOPA is my college who regulates all the SLPs and audiologists in Alberta. Um, so they had a very recent membership diversity survey looking at what clinicians look like, where do they come from, and and maybe something that wasn't obvious here are the caseloads that they work with. So in, I was actually surprised because in when um, the American so the American Association of Speech Language Pathologists put out their um, survey or the results of their survey, they found that there was only eight percent were who identified as people of color for clinicians and for us i believe if i'm not mistaken in axopa it was about nine percent who identified as a visible minority so it's a little bit more than um what the american association presented but it's still not um, an accurate representation of the population here in Alberta um, so we need more of us to be able to have like a better representation of the people that we serve and it's very strange because sometimes I think about that dynamic that if um, a person who is white is offering a lot of services to somebody who is a person of color there could be some biases that in there and i'm not saying that all of my like other all other slps aren't doing a good job like some are doing an excellent job but just that dynamic that some families are subject to the biases of a majority culture um can be a disadvantage as well so which is why it's very important for SLPs of color to be part of that policy and decision-making process not only not only for services but also for um, just policies around education around healthcare, about accessing services for people of people of color or for like lower income families and it's just very important to have that representation because unless there is a voice of somebody who's had that lived experience or even um, that understanding of what other um, people are experiencing then it's going to be hard for like the higher ups or people who make the policies to make a policy just for just to support that group of people so the other um, consideration maybe is that there needs to be more demographics involved and when researchers or clinicians are trying to test efficacy or effectiveness of treatment so a lot of um, the participants of research studies tend to be uh, Western part of the Western culture and now there's I love that there's more um, emphasis in adding the demographics of who is part of that treatment and we have to know that 
the treatment also works for other people from other cultures, from <clears throat> other ways of living, if that kind of treatment is also effective for them. So the path forward. Um, mostly, we've kind of touched on this. So the current state is that there has to be continued advocacies. And I, I'm actually happy that there is some work that's done at the association level. So association is uh, just an association of SLPs in America and in Canada. They've just been starting. I'm like, well, I'm happy and both disappointed. So happy in that they are starting their work in equity, diversity, and inclusion. But disappointed in that it took them a long time to understand the dynamics of that. Um, there is currently advocacy being done at the provincial level through the colleges or so um, and we're actually like I'm actually happy to be part of a regional advisory committee for the SAC so the Association of SLPs in Canada um, for the Alberta um, province so there we get to make more decisions on how we can advocate for our client for our clients and also for um, diversity and inclusion of our field. Uh, there's also advocacy, uh, advocacy that needs to be done at the workplace level where you work and really depends also where you are and there's more, I find that there's a bit more awareness of other cultures when you're in the city as opposed to maybe a smaller town. Um, and maybe there needs to be some work there too. The other advocacy that is being done right now is on university admissions and programs. So how are universities admitting people? For the longest time, it was mostly focused on the majority population and there would be just a couple of people of color. So in that sense, they kind of perpetuate the notion of keeping, gatekeeping the profession to a specific kind of person, whereas it has to be <clears throat> represented by different people from different walks of life, people from different cultures. Um, I think the other piece is to be constantly reflecting on my biases or, or, or on our biases, our privileges, and seeking out those uh, professional development and those resources um, to for treatment considerations when we're working with multicultural families, with um, people who are transitioning, for example, that kind of thing. So how can we be anti-racist? How can we be gender affirming in our practices? And, <clears throat> and it is true that this is a lot of advocacy, but it's very important to also have a support group of people who maybe are the same, who are people of color, who have similar lived experience and going through all the, the issues and how we can make better of it. And yeah, I know there might be a lot of things to talk about, but, and this is just pretty much the surface level of things, um, but I do hope that <clears throat> this conversation, well, it's more like me talking to you, <laughs> but I hope that this lecture has helped you start thinking about how, like, our biases or what we are has influences on bigger systems and how we can change the way that works if we can in our lifetime so um i've left you with some reflection items here and this <clears throat> this is not an exam by all means i just want you to be thinking about what you learned what you have a question and actually if there's any anything that wasn't clear in this lecture i'm i would be happy to answer any of them um, but this is just meant to spark your interest, maybe if you had any, about communication and um, what my role is as a speech-language pathologist. But I really thank you for listening today. So have a good day and... We'll